Welcome to another installment of the Sanctuary Salvation and Our Savior. And I'm really excited about today's study because in today's lesson, we'll be looking at the Ark of the Covenant and specifically the Law of God, the Ten Commandments, which was located inside the chest known as the Ark of the Covenant. Now on the screen behind me is a LED of a depiction of the Shekinah glory of God. This was the very presence of God that was in the sanctuary, the most holy place of the sanctuary. And inside this chest was the Ten Commandments on which God wrote with his own finger on tablets of stone and God received or God gave Moses the Ten Commandments and instructed him to put it inside the Ark of the Covenant. Now there's a lot of contradictions that seem to come out of Scripture and there's some confusion in the Christian community about the law of God and the Ten Commandments. Some individuals say that the law of God was done away at the cross. Other individuals say that if you break one, you break them all. Which is it? Is the law still binding today or has it been done away with at the cross? And the solution for this seeming contradiction is really that there are two laws in the Bible. Let's go to our screen here. We have on the left side the Ten Commandments, and on the right side, you have Moses' ceremonial law. And I want to compare and contrast these two. Let's go to the left-hand column here. The Ten Commandments was written by God, according to Exodus chapter 31, verse 18, and was written on stone. When God gave Moses the Ten Commandments, He didn't dictate the Ten Commandments to Moses and say, hey, I'm about to give you something very important. I want you to write it down. No, this was so important to God that God said, I'm going to write this myself. And notice the material that God used for the Ten Commandments. He didn't write it on parchment. He didn't write it on a scroll. He wrote it in stone. Have you ever heard the saying, written in stone? Does that indicate that it's of passing nature or rather unchangeable? Notice the very material that God chose to write the Ten Commandments was stone, signifying that this was of an eternal, unchanging form. This is not to change. He wrote it himself on tablets of stone. And notice the location, as we mentioned before, Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 5. It was deposited by Moses inside of the ark. The location of this is very important because the Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat, the Shekinah glory, the angels hovering over the Shekinah glory was the throne of God and it was placed inside of the Ark. In other words, the very foundation, the throne of God was to be the, the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments was not to be placed in the courtyard. The Ten Commandments was not to be placed in the holy place. The Ten Commandments was not just to be placed in the most holy place in any, any sector of it. No, the most sacred entity in the entire sanctuary was the Ark of the Covenant, and the Ark of the Covenant held within it, in the chest, representing the throne room of God, was the Ten Commandments placed inside of the Ark. Now, the very location of the Ten Commandments indicates its significance, and we'll be unpacking that as we go into our study. Isaiah chapter 42, verse 21, Christ was to magnify the law and make it honorable. In other words, Jesus did not come to do away with the Ten Commandments, but as we see in the Beatitudes, Jesus came to expound on the Ten Commandments. He said, you have heard, thou shalt not commit adultery. But if you commit adultery or you think about lust in your own mind, in your own heart, you have committed adultery in your heart. He expounds on the Ten Commandments. So we look at the Ten Commandments, written by God, written on stone, deposited by Moses inside of the ark. Christ was to magnify the law and make it honorable. Now let's take a look at the other law, Moses' ceremonial law, and we'll compare and contrast these two. Let's take a look at our screen once again. Moses' ceremonial law, it was written by Moses. God's law, the Ten Commandments, written by God. This one was written by Moses, and according to Exodus chapter 24, verse 4, it was placed in a book. 
The third part, Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 26, it was deposited by the Levites by the side of the ark. Now notice the distinction between the two just in terms of location. The Ten Commandments was placed inside of the ark while the book of Moses, which was written by Moses and placed inside a book, was placed at the side of the ark. So just by location, the Ten Commandments had a higher place. It was placed inside the Ark of the Covenant while the book of Moses was placed outside of the Ark of the Covenant. In Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 26, it was to be against the people. And in Colossians chapter 22, verse 14, it says that you blot the, the blot, they blotted out the handwriting of ordinances that was to be against the people. In other words, when the Bible talks about the law of God being done away with, it's not talking about the Ten Commandments. It's talking about Moses' law. It was to be of a passing nature. And when Jesus died on the cross, there's something significant that took place there in terms of the temple. The temple veil was rent from top to bottom, indicating a transition from the sacrificial ceremonial feast. When Jesus died on the cross as the Passover lamb, we don't have to kill a lamb today anymore. And I praise the Lord for that. Praise the Lord that Jesus is the Passover. Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And all of the ceremonial feasts and festivals that pointed forward to Jesus, we don't have to keep them anymore. These are not a part of the Christian uh, um, ceremonies and, and rituals. We don't have to do these anymore because Jesus came as the Lamb of God and Moses' law was nailed to the cross. But this is not talking about the Ten Commandments. This is talking about the ceremonial law, which is of passing nature. Now, this is a question that was posed to Billy Graham in regards to the law, in regards to some of the confusion that is out there. Here's the question to Billy Graham. Some religious people that I know tell me that the Ten Commandments are part of the law and that they do not apply to us today. They say that as Christians, we're free from the law. Is that right? And here's Billy Graham's answer. No, it is not right. And I hope that you will not be misled by these false opinions. It is very important that Christians understand what the Bible means when it says they are free from the law. It certainly does not mean they are free from the obligations of the moral law and are at liberty to sin. You see, the word law is used by the New Testament in two senses. Sometimes it refers to the ceremonial law of the Old Testament, which is concerned about ritual matters and regulations regarding food, drink, and things of that kind. This ceremonial law was of a passing character and was done away with when Christ came. From this law, Christians are indeed free. But the New Testament does also speak of a moral law, which is of a permanent, unchanging character and is summarized in the Ten Commandments. This law sets forth God's demands on human life and on man's duties to God and his neighbor. That it definitely applies to Christians is made clear in Romans 13, 8 through 10. Billy Graham. I agree with this assessment. There are two laws. Moses' law was of a passing nature and was done away with. It was nailed to the cross. But the Ten Commandment law, which was placed inside of the ark, is of an eternal nature. It was not done away with at the cross. And Billy Graham's assessment here is absolutely correct. In James chapter 1, verse 23, the Bible tells us that the law of God is like a mirror. I praise the Lord for mirrors. A mirror tells the truth. Have you ever gone through a day and you think you just look fine? And then you look in the mirror and then you're like, oh, people were looking at me and I look like this, you know, and uh, you don't get mad at the mirror. You do an adjustment. In other words, the mirror is a moment of self-awareness. The mirror shows us our need. 
In the same way, the law of God is not the solution. The law of God is not like a bar of soap. It doesn't clean us up. The law of God shows us our need of a Savior. So when we talk about the law of God, we must remember that we're not saved through the law. The law is the standard. The law is a transcript of the character of God. The law is like a mirror and shows us our need of a Savior. As we look into the mirror of God's perfect righteousness, His perfect character, we see that we are sinners in need of a Savior. So the law points to Jesus. The law is not like a bar of soap. That is, its purpose is not to clean us up, but to show us our great need. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments, John 14, verse 15. So God's faithful people keep his law because they love him, not in order to be saved, but because they are saved by his amazing grace. This is important for us to recognize that we are not saved through the law. We are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone. And the law is a transcript of God's character. He writes it in our own hearts. And we love him because he first loved us. It is not the means of salvation. It is the response to the love of God. The law of God is. Now, when we look at the Ten Commandments, we note that the first four are in reference to our love to God. The last six are in reference to our love to our neighbor. In other words, if you love God, you will keep the Sabbath. If you love God, you will have no other gods before him. If you love God, you won't worship idols. If you love your neighbor, you won't kill him. You won't take his wife. You won't lie, cheat, or steal from him. In other words, the law of God is fulfilled in love. And God wants to write that law in our own hearts and in our own minds. The law of God is not a, an imposed extrinsic idea of obligation. We think of the law in terms of you can't, you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do this. But actually, the law of God is written in a way that really says in a form of a promise, you will not. Quite a different paradigm, isn't it? In other words, if you love God, you will not have any other gods before him. If you love your neighbor, you will not kill him. If you love your neighbor, you will not cheat. You will not take his wife. So the Ten Commandments, the fulfilling of the Ten Commandments, is God writing his law of love in our own hearts, and you will not do these things. The Ten Commandments, written by God, written on stone, were placed inside of the Ark of the Covenant. The transcript of God's character, the very foundation of God's throne, was placed inside this chest, signifying that this was the foundation of God's government. We're going to take a short break, and when we come back, We'll continue in our study of the law of God, how God wants to write his law in our own hearts and our own minds. We're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we'll continue in our study of the law of God, which is in the Ark of the Covenant. Welcome back. Before the break, we were talking about the law of God, the Ten Commandments, which were written by stone, written by God, and were placed by Moses inside of the Ark of the Covenant. And we talked about how love is the fulfilling of the law. The law of God is a transcript of God's character. On the screen, we have a comparison of God and His law. And you will notice that every element, every aspect of God's character is mentioned also about the law of God. Here's a few examples. God is spiritual. His law is spiritual. God is love. His law is love. God is truth. His law is truth. God is righteous. His law is righteous. God is holy. His law is holy. God is perfect. His law is perfect. God stands forever. His law stands forever. God is good. His law is good. God is just. His law is just. God is pure. His law is pure. God is unchangeable. His law is unchangeable. In other words, every characteristic of the law of God is also a characteristic of God himself. The law of God is a transcript 
of his character. And the fulfilling of the law is love. Every aspect, every characteristic of the law of God is, is also a characteristic of who he is. It's a transcript of his character. And no wonder the law of God was written in stone because this is who God is. He's perfect. He's loving. He stands forever. He's holy, just, and pure. Now, we're talking about the Ark of the Covenant. And whenever the Ark of the Covenant was transported from place to place, incidentally, the Ark of the Covenant was never seen by the Israelites. Only the high priest was able to see the, the cherubim and the Shekinah glory, and he was only able to do that once a year. When the Ark of the Covenant was being transported, they were not able to see inside to see the, the chest. All they saw was this covering. And here in Numbers chapter 4, verse 5 and 6, the Bible tells us, When the camp prepares to journey, Aaron and his son shall come, and they shall take down the covering veil and cover the Ark of the Testimony with it. They shall put on it a covering of badger skins and spread over that a cloth entirely of blue and they shall insert its poles. So when the children of Israel would go from place to place, remember the tabernacle of Moses was a makeshift, uh, I should say a portable tabernacle. It was able to be put up for travel. And when the Ark of the Covenant was being transported, it would be covered. And all the children of Israel would see was this blue covering over the Ark of the Covenant. I have an artist's depiction here. This is all that the Israelites would see. The priest would be holding the Ark of the Covenant and this blue cloth would be over the top of the Ark of the Covenant. So as they went from place to place, the Israelites would see the color blue. What did the color blue symbolize? We have another text in Numbers chapter 15, verse 38 and 39. Speak to the children of Israel, tell them to make tassels on the corners of their garments throughout their generations and to put a blue thread in the tassels of the corners. So the children of Israel were told to make this clothing and in the clothing they were to have these tassels and in the tassels they were to use a particular color. It was the color blue. Now, why were they to put the color blue in their tassels? The Bible goes on and says, And you shall have the tassels that you may look upon it and remember all the commandments of the Lord and do them. Very interesting. So as the children of Israel were going through their day and they saw in their tassels that blue cloth, the color blue, what was it to remind them of? It was to remind them of the Ten Commandments. It was to remind them of the law of God. So as they went through their day, and even as they looked at their clothes, the color blue represented the Ten Commandments. And the Ark of the Covenant was colored in blue, covered in blue, signifying also the Ten Commandments as well. There's another place in which the color blue arises, and this is from Exodus chapter 24, verse 9 through 12. Then Moses, Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel went up, and they saw the God of Israel. And there was under his feet, as it were, a pavement of sapphire stone, like the very heaven for clearness. And the Lord said to Moses, Come up to the mountain and wait here, and I will give you the tables of stone with the law and the commandment which I have written for their instruction. Here they see God and notice that God is standing on something. They see God and he's standing on a sapphire stone. What a picture that must have, be, have been. The, the, the God is standing on this sapphire stone. What color is sapphire? Sapphire is the color blue. In other words, the very foundation of what God is standing on is the color blue. And then God says to Moses, come up here and I will give you tables of stone. Now, let's back up here. God is standing on a stone and the stone is the color blue. And God says, come up here and I will give you tables of stone. Now, there's something here in the richness 
of the Hebrew. Because when you study the, the Hebrew here, the, the richness of the Hebrew brings out, when it says tables of stone, it should actually say the tables of the stone. Now there's a difference. The tables of the stone, and when you look at the literary context of this, scholars believe that the tables of the stone that Moses was given on Mount Sinai came from the sapphire stone that God was standing on. In other words, when God was going to find the material to give Moses the Ten Commandments, he wanted to portray the significance of the Ten Commandments. And what better significance of the Ten Commandments than the very foundation of what God is standing on and what His throne is founded upon. He took it from the sapphire stone. And so scholars believe that the Ten Commandments, the tables of the stone, which God took from the very foundation on which He was standing on, in the Hebrew, the nuance, the evidence is there that God took the tables of the sapphire stone and gave it to Moses, that when Moses took it down from the mountain and placed it inside the ark, that the Ten Commandment stones were sapphire. In other words, they were the color blue. There's another place in Scripture where the color blue arises, and in 2 Chronicles chapter 5, verse 10, there was nothing in the ark save the two tables which Moses put therein at Horeb when the Lord uh, made a covenant with the children of Israel. When they came out of Egypt, note Horeb is another name for Sinai. Now, in the transition period between the tabernacle of Moses and Solomon, there was only the tables of the stone that were left in the Ark of the Covenant. Remember, there were a couple other articles that were placed inside the chest, the Ark of the Covenant. It was Aaron's rod that budded and a pot of manna and the Ten Commandments. But when they transitioned from Moses' tabernacle to Solomon's temple, only the tables of the stone were left there. In other words, the Ten Commandments were the only thing that were left inside of Solomon's temple. This is important. In Ezekiel chapter 10, verse 11, Then I looked, and behold, in the firmament that was above the head of the cherubims, there appeared over them, as it were, a sapphire stone, as the appearance and likeness of a throne. Notice that in Ezekiel chapter 10, verse 1, the, here Ezekiel is not seeing the Ark of the Covenant. He's seeing actually what the Ark of the Covenant pointed toward, and that was the throne of God. Here Ezekiel is seeing a throne or the throne of God. And notice that this entity, the sapphire stone, appears. And notice there are cherubim that are above the sapphire stone, just like is depicted by the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant had the cherubim, and inside the Ark of the Covenant was the sapphire stone. And here Ezekiel is seeing the real thing. He's seeing this vision of heaven in verse 26. Above the firmament, over their heads, there was the likeness of a throne, in appearance like sapphire, and seated above the likeness of a throne was, as it were, the likeness of a human form. Let's look at this. Ezekiel sees a vision of God sitting on his throne, and the very throne of God is made of sapphire. This has special significance, friends, because it indicates that the very foundation of God's government, the very principles on which God governs the universe, the very throne room of God is made of sapphire, indicating that the Ten Commandments and the principles found therein, the law of love and liberty, is the very undergirding and the foundation of the government of God, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. It's no wonder that Lucifer in the great controversy made an attack against the law of God. Because if you can strike at the foundation of God's government, you can undermine all of the principles of which God and His kingdom stand for. In these verses, Ezekiel identifies the blue and sapphire stone that God is standing on as the throne of God. That means that the sapphire stone God is standing on in Exodus chapter 24 represented God's throne, and the Ten Commandments were taken directly out of 
God's throne. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 8, the Bible says, But unto the Son he said, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is a scepter of thy kingdom. If God's throne is eternal, then it also means that God's law is eternal as well. The Bible says that God's throne will last forever. And by implication, if the law of God, the sapphire stone is God's throne, then the law of God is forever as well. And God wants to write the law of God in our own hearts and our own minds. Romans chapter 13, verse 8 through 13, the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and whatever other command there may be are summed up in this one command, love your neighbor as yourself, love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Back in Eden, in Edenic perfection, Adam and Eve did not have to wake up every day and go to, to this law that was there and say, oh, I got to remember today not to lie, cheat, and steal. No, the law of God in Eden were written not on tables of stone, but it was written on the hearts of Adam and Eve. They were converted. They were sanctified. They were naturally loving. The law of God was written in their hearts. And the sanctuary message is, is the message of how God wants to bring us into the courtyard, into the holy place, into the most holy place experience where the law of God is. And He wants to bring us all the way back to Eden where Adam and Eve were. He wants to write the law of God today, not on tables of stone, but on the tablets of your heart. He wants to write it on your mind, on your heart, on your consciousness, so that you will, by the grace of God, respond by loving your neighbor as yourself and loving God with all your heart. Stay with us as we continue our study of the sanctuary, salvation, and our Savior. <laughs> 